Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for the Alex on Tech and ITY TV video. I'm joined today by Charlie Welch. He is the CEO and co-founder of California-based battery company ZapBat. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Great to have you here. Now, Charlie, your bio states that you're an aerospace engineer. So how did you get interested in battery technologies? And what's your first memory of using batteries and realizing that they stored portable energy? Absolutely. It's a, it's a somewhat interesting story, uh, as you said, uh, an aerospace engineer that now works on batteries. So yeah. uh, in college, I used to work uh, on solar powered electric aircraft. So basically aircraft where their wings were solar panels and we use batteries to store the energy so they could, in theory, fly indefinitely. And from there, I got hired by Northrop Grumman Aerospace uh, in, in applied research in battery chemistry and battery technology. And so I kind of got thrown into the deep end of working with every battery chemistry you can imagine, uh, mostly for the military from as exotic as you can think of, you know, from kind of the bleeding edge technology to the classic incumbents. And I got the experience of building batteries for a whole variety of systems uh, on and off this planet, everything you can think of. And then kind of where that also became an interesting angle was uh, at that point, we started a project at Northrop where we built battery powered systems uh, for the San Diego Zoo to aid in, in wildlife conservation. So I built uh, battery systems to help study polar bears up in the Arctic, uh, down to the swampy, swampy rainforest of South America and kind of everything in between. Uh, so I got this kind of hands-on experience of, you know, wanting to make aircraft more electric and kind mm -hmm. of figuring out how to do that to being thrown into the battery side and really falling in love with it. And then seeing how to do that, uh, both for kind of the classic aerospace military side, but then also for interesting applications like wildlife and everything in between, which was kind of a, a fun story. And, you know, from very early on, I think uh, batteries are just such a fun example of how to store energy. Like you said, I think we all have experienced that joy of a kid is putting a double A battery into a toy and seeing it come to life. And then when that thing's dead, you know, you can't wait to plug another one in. So I think nothing in particular, but I, I definitely experienced that as, as a young child. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, batteries, uh, it's, it's incredible to hear about, you know, you had to use batteries off planet or you were designing them for off planet and also for those polar regions. I mean, I know that with my Mac, if I've tried to use it in uh, where I am in Canberra, the uh, capital of Australia, similar to Washington, D.C., we have um, minus 10 degrees centigrade, oh, sorry, 10 degrees centigrade. So it's still above zero. Still, mm -hmm. it's not freezing. And uh, if it's under 10 degrees centigrade, the Mac won't turn on, or at least, you know, the Intel Macs uh, that I've used, I'm not sure about the M1 Macs, but, you know, if the better, I mean, and the iPhone can work in colder temperatures, but it was, it's, it's a shock to think you've got to warm your computer up just to be able to use it outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, trying to get a battery working in a polar, a polar environment must have been challenging. It was incredible. I mean, it was, I could have a battery, I could have my phone in my pocket that was warm and functioning. And within, to be quite honest, five seconds of being outside, you know, we were in minus 30, minus 40 uh, Celsius, which was incredible. My phone would turn off in seconds mm. and we had to have, you know, electric powered drones that had to, you know, survive for, you know, half an hour to an hour in the air, you know, in these conditions to help map sea ice, which was getting batteries to survive in those conditions was just, was just an incredible challenge, yeah. uh, which, oh. which we did successfully, I can say. So I've, I've seen what it takes to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, I've seen those videos where someone's pouring boiling hot water in an environment that's like minus 20 or 30 degrees in Canada or Siberia or something, and by the time it hits the ground, it's frozen. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> those are incredible engineering challenges. Now, most people are well aware of lithium-ion batteries. It's uh, the batteries that's in our phones and tablets and laptops and battery-powered tools, consumer appliances, I mean, everywhere, even the cars and home power battery systems that people are buying. And uh, most people know that, that they take hours to recharge, and if they're damaged, they can have these runaway thermal events where the, you know, the fires can last for hours, and you've got the um, uh, fire departments that have to get special training or information from Tesla how to put these batteries out. So what is the technology that is inside of your batteries, the ZapBat batteries? What is the chemistry? Why is it different? And how is it radically better? So lithium titanate is a very unique chemistry. It was originally developed about two decades ago, uh, originally with kind of military applications where they wanted a safer, uh, a more reliable, and then a, a chemistry that can move energy and power very, very quickly. And so titanate is actually a nanocrystal of titanium. 
And what that allows it to do is one, charge extremely quickly. I mean, these batteries we have can charge in 15 minutes or less, uh, and it's been proven to do so. And the second piece is that it's what's considered an inert chemistry. So it prevents itself from going to thermal runaway. So that titanate nanocrystal uh, under these kind of thermal runaway conditions will actually phase change and go from a conductor to a resistor where now you don't have a thermal runaway condition. So it's literally the, one of the safest chemistries on the planet. You know, these batteries will never go into self thermal runaway and that's why they were designed to do so. You know, I think when these other chemistries were designed uh, to fit kind of the consumer electronics, energy density was the key factor there, which was obviously very important. Mm. And what that came with was using chemistries that can be more volatile in certain conditions. Now, obviously there's millions of batteries out. I'm not saying that all these are going to catch fire, but in certain conditions, batteries can be dangerous. I think it's something obviously worth considering. You mentioned that LTO, lithium titanate, has been used in military applications. So why haven't we seen it in use in uh, you know, modern smartphones or modern applications? What's prevented it from being uh, the choice instead of lithium ion? So when uh, early battery chemistries got adopted about you know, 15, 15, 20 years ago, you can roughly say, the two industries driving the technology was really portable electronics, so laptops, mm-hmm. cell phones, And then you can say early automotive, which was people trying to figure out how we could make electric vehicles. And at that time, lithium titanate was one, not energy dense enough to make those applications fit. And it was way too expensive. You know, technologies that sometimes start with the military, like GPS or or other examples, you know, they don't have cost in mind. And so when it was originally designed, it was all performance. It was, we want the best battery in all these categories. And that didn't really fit the industry's driving, you know, these, these kind of battery technologies. Now, what's happened is that lithium titanate, you know, it's really had a resurgence um, where it's kind of coming to the forefront. But its two challenges are that because it didn't get the attention from these industries, it didn't get the attention from the electronics and it didn't get the attention from the software. Mm. And so that's where we've kind of come in at Zapat to say, you know, this battery has all this amazing capability and what it's really lacking is the integration. And so we've built basically the, the hardware and software to make lithium titanate now one for one swap of any lithium ion chemistry. Uh, we're kind of kind of uh, unlocking its full potential from uh, it being a, a dark horse. We have to call it the, the sea biscuit of batteries to a certain extent. You know, it's been seen as an underdog for a long time, but I think it's time is for prime time because it's a proving technology. Now you have a great article at Power Mag uh, magazine, which I'll link to in the article that accompanies this video, which goes through a lot of the technical details and explains all sorts of things, including the AI. So tell us a bit more about how the battery density, uh, energy density issue was solved and how AI has enabled you to really, you know, allow the battery to uh, discharge more intelligently, you know, power up more intelligently and charge more intelligently. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. So energy density for a long time has been treated as this very static metric where it's like, I buy this much energy, I get this much energy in theory. But to be honest, it's as far from that as possible. Energy density is this alive metric that changes day to day, hour to hour, uh, minute to minute. It's almost like uh, an ultra marathon runner in which you assume if I ate a cheeseburger, I'm going to convert that entire cheeseburger to energy no matter how fast I run, how slow I run, exactly what I'm doing. And lithium titanate's big advantage is that it moves energy very quickly, very efficiently. And so what the software can allow us to do is say, you know, in certain conditions, maybe your battery wasn't fully optimized for that. Maybe the battery should show us how to optimize it better. So maybe an e-bike in Stockholm, Sweden, or an e-bike in Los Angeles shouldn't have the exact same battery, you know, different, as you mentioned in the very beginning, different temperatures, mm-hmm. different riding styles, different environments, hills, you know, everything in between. Um, for example, we've, we've seen that in lots of instances when we can improve regenerative braking, you know, uh, energy density is really a system level problem. And we've seen where in certain environments, if I can regenerate uh, braking more efficiently, I can get better range because my battery can now accept more energy when I'm going down hills and everything in between. And so the AI and the software is really meant to have our batteries teach us how to make them more efficient. And lithium mm-hmm. titanate is the perfect key for that because it's so good at uh, having that kind of freedom of input and output and then learning how to, to use energy better. You know, we always give the example of, you know, as humans, we don't eat all of our food for the day for breakfast and then wait until we're dead. 
to almost eat again. Like we're, we've built this regenerative environment where we, we break for lunch and we make things efficient here and there, depending on what our need is. And that's what our kind of goal is. Now, we, at the beginning, we also talked about the temperature. I mean, you just mentioned it just then. In Stockholm, it's going to be colder than in Los Angeles. In San Francisco, you're going to have more hills than in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the battery, obviously, as you said, can, you know, artificial or well, intelligently modify itself to those environments, or you can have that specification. But also the important thing is the operating temperatures. Now, the operating temperatures that this battery can operate in appear to be vastly superior to that of lithium ion. So what are they? They're huge. I mean, we can operate these, these, this chemistry from minus 30 Celsius to 55 Celsius uh, at an, at a saturated temperature, which is amazing. You know, most lithium chemistry. And, and what is that for Fahrenheit for those who are watching in the U S or elsewhere? Oh man, you're going to get me on my conversions. I know for the negative, it's easier. I think it's, it's all, it equates to minus 30 Fahrenheit as well. I think that's, a, okay. I, <laughs> I think that's like one twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. Fahrenheit. I mean, that- Huge range, huge ranges. Yeah. I mean, I know that my iPhone, for example, in the summer, you know, with the OLED screen, it'll the OLED screen will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as the phone heats up. And I have one of these uh, pop sockets on the back, and that if mm-hmm. I have that on, that warms the whole thing up. And and uh, I mean, that's the screen. That's the 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 um, more to do with the unit itself. But there's those operating temperatures are fantastic. Yep. So I've we we'll have one on my desk here to, to show. So like this, this is a uh, the guts of our e bike battery, uh, obviously with all the the casing and stuff taken off, but yeah. you know, this is qualified to work as low as minus 30 and as hot as, you know, Palm Springs in the summer. Mm. And, uh, on, from a safety perspective, we've literally hammered a nail straight through this thing to, to, to confirm that for, thermal runaway is as reliable as we say it is. And so yeah. we're pretty excited that temperature stability is going to be, you know, a bigger and bigger factor. You know, people want batteries every part of the world, not just where it's temperate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, the, um, the safety issue, I mean, in a military environment, things get blown up and damaged all the time. So you can imagine if that was in a tank or something, it would have, it would have been quite dangerous if it was lithium ion. So clearly that's where the military application came in. Uh, now, also, you've said you've started with micromobility, uh, which is those little scooters, that's a scooter battery. But how soon can we expect to see these batteries in, uh, you know, electric cars, in the Tesla Powerwall type of uh, you know, environments, home batteries, and in our phones and tablets and, you know, home power tools, everywhere else that we currently see lithium ion. Yeah. So we at Zapad are focused on basically three key markets right now, which is um, micromobility, as you said, anything in golf cart or smaller. And those will be coming out uh, early next year. You know, we have pilots running this year. They'll be coming out this year. But, you know, the first production versions will be coming out um, about a year from now. And... Where we definitely see application going is to certain consumer applications like, uh, you know, leaf blowers, lawnmowers, anything where you want a battery to charge as fast as you're going to use it hmm. uh, to a certain extent. And then we absolutely want to move to the infrastructure side. So the ability for lithium titanate to be residential energy storage, uh, you know, that's kind of where it's got its birth uh, on certain industrial sides. And, you know, the battery on my desk here is qualified for 15,000 cycles. Well, I was about to say, you know, that's, I mean, the the advantage of lithium titanate, like it's, it's uh, charges in 20 minutes. I mean, that means that when it runs out, you just plug it in for a few minutes, bang, you're back to full. It -hmm. operates in incredibly amazing temperatures, temperature ranges. And then, I mean, the lifespan, everyone has seen where they had a mobile phone or or a battery pack and it starts to expand after a couple of years and just has 10% of its life. I mean, tell us about this incredible lifespan of lithium titanate, which which blows away any other battery technology I've ever heard of, except for maybe lead acid, which you definitely don't want powering your mobile phone. Absolutely not. So lithium titanate has been tested and qualified to 45,000 cycles in, in full honesty. And if that's a cycle a day, that's over a hundred years of lifetime. And so our bet and my personal opinion is that lithium titanate will be the infrastructure chemistry of the future. Undoubtedly, it's the safest, it's the lastest long, longing, and it's been proven. You know, I think there's a lot of technologies that people think are a silver bullet when it comes to batteries. And unfortunately, I think that's farther away than people give it credit for. You know, lithium titanate's been proven to do this. And I think it is going to be the infrastructure chemistry to kind of power this, um, you know, this more electrified future. I mean, a power wall that's going to last 50 years is going to completely transform residential energy storage. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the longest lasting battery I've ever heard of. And uh, to, I mean, you know, your battery, if you had that in your mobile phone, 
the battery would last longer than your phone. I mean, we, we'd want that to be a modular battery so you could pop it out of your phone, pop, pop it into your next one. Absolutely, yeah. Especially with all the energy we're putting in mining these materials. And I'm sure, as we all know, we're putting a lot of effort to make these batteries. I think we should have them last as long as possible, even if we have to swap them out every couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that is uh, a game changer. And uh, I mean, you know, how come people haven't worked on uh, LTO batteries like this before? I mean, are you the first person to really think about this for the consumer application and come up with the AI smarts? Or are there other people trying to work on this too? No, the, there's there's a lot of other people that are working on the, the chemistry side. What, we, what we've really tried to do is that what people often don't see with new battery chemistries is that uh, oftentimes it's the integration that's just as challenging as making a new chemistry. You know, when people say, uh, let's assume a miracle battery exists. Sometimes, even if you had a miracle bucket of water, if you have terrible plumbing, it doesn't matter, right? You don't see the benefit of it. And that's where we've tried to take all this great work people have done with lithium titanate and really try and optimize it to be as consumer friendly, as cost friendly, as integration friendly as possible. Because these businesses and everybody building their businesses around a battery, they just want a one for one swap. And that's what we hmm. want to offer them, which is that we want you to swap your battery out, swap a zap bat in plus minus, and there you go. Uh, we want it to be as easy as that, which sometimes adopting new chemistries can be quite the opposite, which is having to revamp every single nut and bolt to make sure that this new chemistry works. And we're trying to take all those barriers away from lithium titanate. So how far are we away from you know, seeing this in production, seeing it in uh, smart watches and phones? I mean, are you waiting for more investment? Are you waiting for more customers? You know, is there a cost issue? Uh, when, when are we going to see this you know, rolled out at scale? The first ones are coming out later this year. So we've taken a very different approach at Zapbat which is we wanted to do the legwork to make uh, an end-to-end -end product before we came out and kind of announced this. You know, there's in the battery space, there's a lot of, you know, we've, we've invented something that's amazing, and it's, but it's 10 years away. You know, it's like, it's mm. like the fusion. That's, that's normally what you hear about. You know, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, coming. it's, the, it's coming. Nuclear fusion syndrome. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, I went to an Intel event in Beijing in 2007. It was the Intel Developer Forum, and they had a company there that was talking about silver zinc batteries. Uh, and that was going to be the future. And these had long, more energy density and that could be recycled. And, and uh, I mean, obviously it never really took off because we don't see them in uh, uh, devices. But mm -hmm. they made an interesting statement, which was that, you know, Moore's law talked about how uh, battery, sorry, about how uh, transistor density on a, you know, on a chip doubled every 18 months. But they said that battery technology is really double in capacity and in advancement every 18 years. So mm -hmm. showing just how long it takes for battery technology to really hit the next level. And if I think back to 2007 and to 2022, well, you know, we're getting closer, we're getting closer to that 18 year mark. Although, you know, I mean, how, how different are today's um, lithium ion batteries to the ones that we saw in you know, the early mobile phones from 2000? Are they really that different? They, they are that they are different. Uh, what I say, they're the, the giant leap that people expected, you know, not, not particularly, unfortunately, mm. you know, energy is such a funny conversation because we grew up, we all grew up with hydrocarbon fuels, right? And, and petrochemical fuels that, uh, to be honest, were developed on a cosmic scale, right? To build hydrocarbons, the earth took billions of years to compress these molecules and make these amazing things for storing energy. And now we're trying to, we're trying to mimic that with batteries, but you know, the challenge is we're trying to put more energy in a tinier area, which is very, very hard. And so we've seen a lot of the optimization of manufacturing. We've seen a lot of the optimization of refining some of the chemistries, but it's not fast and it's not easy and it gets harder and harder. It's not a linear scale of difficulty. It's an exponential scale. You know, adding that extra couple percent of energy density often comes with costs. You know, to be honest, the other side is... Um, there's infinite demand, you know, our batteries have gotten better and better, but my, my battery left my phone hasn't necessarily gotten better because every single percent of energy density is being gobbled up by 5g or mobile streaming or mobile gaming or every single electron an app can get, it's going to try and grab. So every mm. percent of increase on a battery certainly has a customer there waiting for it on my smartphone. Yeah. It's fair to say that if we were still using the uh, 2g Nokia's, from uh, you know 2000, we'd be having uh, two m weeks or a month of battery life. <laughs> yeah, it'd be amazing. Modern batteries. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if we covered it before because I probably jumped in excitedly. But you know, what's the cost of these batteries uh, compared to lithium ion? You know, um, is and do you and do you need more investment or what's happening there? 
Mm -hmm. So right now they're about twice the price. So mm -hmm. for a typical battery, we're going to supply to a customer, let's say an e-bike or consumer product, we're double the price uh, upfront. But the the factor we're trying to, to show is that that battery is going to last 10 times as long. So in honesty, it is cheaper over time. But, you know, there's been an obsession with dollar per kilowatt hour, which is mm. what am I going to pay for this battery right now? And uh, from that perspective, it is more expensive, but it's a better technology. You know, it's a higher quality technology and it's meant to last, you know, a decade or more. So mm. um, we are more expensive from that front. And the, the spot that we're at is we're, uh, we zap at are just kind of uh, launching in our first initial markets. Uh, you know, we've closed our initial kind of seed investment and we're getting ready to go raise later this year uh, to kind of grow these contracts that we've gotten. So we're kind of in an exciting time where we're getting ready for these batteries to kind of come out to market. You know, I'm pretty excited for this to be in a bike. Um, you know, yeah. we feel like once a bike can charge in 15 minutes, you know, it's a pretty fundamental change uh, for that industry. And the customers that we have are, are very excited to offer that and to show what that's going to do to their business model. And, you know, we want to grow pretty quickly. You know, we want this idea of the fast fashion area era of batteries to be over. Um, yeah. And the idea of that, you know, you're investing in a battery for a long time and you should, uh, you know, you should pay a little bit more for that up front, but you should expect that to last as long as possible. And is that battery the same sort of weight? I mean, are we going to, I mean, these, this, this little lithium ion battery here, 27 uh, you know, milliamp hours, it's pretty heavy. Um, but I mean, you know, it's not that heavy really, but it, I, and it's enough to charge my laptop, but that battery that you have there, is that, would that be the same sort of weight in a, for a traditional lithium ion battery for scooters or is it? heavier or lighter uh-huh yeah it's right about the same weight um yeah. the the physics of the chemistries are, are pretty much um yeah somewhat static obviously there's been improvements of energy yeah. density but uh, we, we offer basically a one for one in terms of weight and, and um and kind of volume roughly and, and once and once these batteries are manufactured at scale won't the price drop so that they'll be you know similar to what lithium-ion batteries are today or is it always going to be more expensive it most likely will drop you know, as, as certain economies of scale hit, but, you know, in all honesty, it will probably always be a little bit more expensive. And also we don't want to put ourselves out of business selling a battery yeah. for nothing that lasts, yeah. you know, 20 years. Yeah, um, that's right. So, but I mean, the, the, that 20 years, 10 years, 20 years, like, you know, and we, we talk about with lithium ion batteries that it drops to about 80% of its life, you know, of, of its energy capacity after two or three years. And people notice it because their phones run out you know, much quicker. And of course, once they start expanding and going bad, they, they really, you know, don't have any mm -hmm. life at all. So after 10 or 20 years, what is the, um, you know, capacity of the battery in terms of how much energy it can pump out compared to when it was brand new? About 90%. So lithium titanium doesn't have the same kind of degradation under, you know, both cycling and, and fast charging that a typical chemistry does. So we see within 15,000 cycles will be the 90% of original state of charge. So uh, if it was a 10-hour battery after 20 years, it would still be giving you nine hours of power. Yes, exactly. Yeah, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And is, are the, are the uh, components recyclable? Can you turn them into new batteries down the track or do they get spent? Uh, it's very recyclable. So titanium for a long time has been heavily recycled, used heavily in aerospace you know, for certain components because of its high strength to weight. And so the fact that you only need lithium and titanium, you know, which... Uh, you know, are both fairly recyclable in terms of batteries, uh, you know, is a big advantage. You know, you don't need nickel, you don't need manganese, you don't need cobalt. And the funny thing, though, is that a lot of lithium titanate systems that have been used in infrastructure military have lasted so long that they haven't had to be recycled yet, <laughs> which is kind of a funny issue. So it's something they haven't fully addressed, to be honest, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it's something they're absolutely looking at. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with mobile phones, I mean, the first iPhones charged to five watts, and then the current iPhones charge at 20 watts. You know, they give you 50% uh, of their battery capacity with a 30-minute with a charge. I've heard of these 85-watt charging systems on various Android phones that can charge your battery to full in, you know, 34 minutes or something. I mean, we keep getting these higher and higher uh, wattages to charge batteries faster and faster. And there's some, you know, German organization called TUW that certifies this is not going to blow up. What is the sort of standard wattage for charging your batteries and can you apply a high wattage to charge them even faster so your 20 minutes goes down to two minutes yeah um, so the peak we can charge at <clears throat> excuse me is down to six minutes at, at kind of full rate now 
at that speed, you're not going to get 15,000 cycles. You'll still mm. get maybe five to 10, which is amazing. Mm. But uh, we feel like it's very rare people charge from zero to hundred. It's, mm. it's more, more often like 20 to 80 or, or kind of sometime in between. And so that's where we come charging. But, you know, for the battery systems we offer, we can accept kilowatt, you know, level power of charging, which is, you know, around a hundred percent of what your wall, your wall outlet can offer from a 110 mm. or 220. Um, so I, I'll, I think I'll happily start... take a few minutes extra charging to get, you know, another 10 years out of my battery. <clears throat> right. Exactly. Exactly. And what about wireless uh, charging? I mean, there's a company I've uh, been covering called Meridot, M-E-R-E-D-O-T, and they've got a wireless charging system for micro mobility. You don't have to plug anything in. You don't have to put the um, uh, the scooter down in any, any particular way. You just drop it on the charger and it starts charging. So, I mean, presumably your batteries can charge wirelessly just like any other. Absolutely. You should need a big charger. Uh, we had, we had recently engaged with a company, a wireless charging company that uh, is, is working on a piece of technology where they can do very, very high power wireless that would be able to charge a wireless e-bike in, in 15 minutes or so, which would be uh, amazing. You know, wi- wireless, I think is absolutely a technology to, to be interested in, you know, um, it's like going from dial-up to, to Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you experience absolutely, it, yeah. you know, you want to plug in again. Yeah, yeah. well, the, when we live in a world where everything is just charged wirelessly, I mean, the electricity companies will freak out on how to, how to bill you for that. <laughs> but they'll find a way. <laughs> they'll find a way. Uh, and what about farming equipment uh, of tomorrow? I mean, the US, Australia are big farming nations. Uh, these, these batteries, can, if they can be in tanks, I guess, they could, or military equipment, they could easily be powering tractors and other equipment with the, you know, energy spikes required to, you know, be digging huge chunks of dirt or cutting, you know, big trees. I guess there's no problem there, right? Not at all. Absolutely. A perfect application where, you know, if you want to build a tractor to be working for, you know, not pun intended, a workhorse, uh, but a robot workhorse, you know, for a long period of time, you absolutely want a battery that can, you know, work in day in, day out. And, um, you know, they're all about uptime, right? They want their systems to be working 24 hours a day, roughly. And so we feel like that's a perfect application we're looking to grow into as well. And I guess uh, the current battery technology is still too, uh, it doesn't have enough energy density to, to put into a 747, but that's the, that, that will be the same for all current battery technology. To lift I think a plane so. Off. Yeah, I think hydrogen is is better suited for aerospace. You know, like hydrogen took us to the moon. We know mm. it works, and it's got a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, um, I think really looking at other energy dense fuels besides batteries, you know, I think is the way to go for aerospace. Particularly, you know, if if I could pick up something not to fly, it would be a giant block of metal um, that doesn't get any lighter as I burn it. So. Um, I don't think batteries are going to be powering a set of 747 anytime soon, but I think they have a lot of promising technologies that a lot of companies look into, like, you know, hydrogen or other um, biogas fuels as well. Yeah, and there's plenty of other, I mean, you know, every gadget that we have that's battery powered uh, is the perfect candidate for this tech. So, I mean, I, I hope to see them by the end of this year, and I hope to be hearing about future iPhones and Androids coming with this technology, even if... Uh, you know, Apple or, or Samsung or others have to have a version which costs more. I think a lot of people will just buy it. They'll say, yep, I want that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think lithium titanium has such a place to grow, you know, and um, the idea is that sometimes you don't have to invent a brand new chemistry, you know, to have such a big impact. Sometimes you have to rediscover, you know, what's been done and, and optimize it to be, yeah. you know, more consumer friendly. So is there anything else about ZapBat and LTO you haven't already told us about that we should know? Yeah, care, care what kind of battery you have. <laughs> I think that's the one thing is, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll go into a room and ask, like, you know, what kind of battery is in your device? Or, and oftentimes, you know, uh, people are unaware. And I think when we're looking at the both the fiscal but environmental impact of what batteries are going to have in the future, I think people should really look for uh, when they buy a battery, investing in something that's going to last as long as possible and, and be as safe as possible. So um, look for Titanate if you can when, when Zapag comes out. Do you think we'll ever see uh, lithium titanate AA batteries? And we've I've seen them with lithium ion inside of them, you know, rechargeable. So do you think we might ever see that for the batteries? Those those old fashioned batteries that are still in use by the trillions every you know every day, I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, we haven't personally looked into it, so I can say I'm I'm not entirely sure. But there's nothing stopping the technology from going there. You know. Yeah. Um, 
I know people Ooh. when their video game controller or whatever runs out, I'm assuming they would love a five minute charge instead of a, um, you know, whatever it is now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've spoken to the Energis and the, um, I think what up people, I can't remember the, the second company, but they've got these wireless charging systems that can beam power across distances and, um, you know, charge devices. So you can have smaller batteries, but I mean, that's not going to be, that, that's ideal in a home or an office or in a cafe, but, you know, driving down the highway, you know, with a, Car, but I mean, that's one of the things is, you know, your car battery, if you have to replace that, that can, at the moment, that can be quite expensive. It will be great to see this in all the electric cars of the future because it will just give those cars a longevity that they currently don't, don't have. I mean, there's going to be a big shock for people in a few years when they suddenly have to pay tens of thousands for new batteries for their Teslas that um, they weren't expecting. Yeah, it's, it'll be astronomical. I mean, the thought of if I bought a car right now, and, you know, I was told the idea of, you know, you might have to replace your entire engine at some time. And I'd be like, mm-hmm. well, I don't know they want to replace my engine. It sounds like it's very expensive. Like, you know, it's replacing the most critical, most expensive part of the entire car. Yeah. Uh, and I, well, I there could, there could idea, be a market for, for sure. there could be a market for uh, LTO upgrades to, um, to, to Tesla's. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> will, somebody will come out with it and expand the lifespan of extend the lifespan. Now, um, uh, you know, as we get towards the end of the interview, I always like to ask the people I'm talking to about uh, the first memory of a computer, of the computer that they used. Um, you know, what, what's what's the memory of your first computer? Oh, that's a fun question. What a what a great thing to ask. I I think for me personally, it's got to be the original iMac. Um, like I remember using floppy disks and other kind of like early age. Uh, you know, tech for for loading software and other stuff. But the first computer we had at home was an iMac, and I and I was obviously too young to, to be working. Was then, that? But you mean the Mac with the three and a half inch floppy, the original? Yes. Yeah. 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 Which was fun. It was. It was a. I, I loved that thing. Um, and then we we upgraded to the Mac that had the you know the colorful kind of dome shape and everything. That was that yeah. was a great. Um, but yeah, right right at the beginning. Um, so I, my dad will probably tell me. Uh, he, he tells me all the time. He's like, oh, I used to run Linux and this and that. And he just tells me, like, that's not the first computer, but that was my first computer. <laughs> and um, just out of curiosity, did you, did, you, did you ever have any bad experiences with batteries? Have any ever blown up? Or, we've all left a battery too long in a transistor radio and seen the little, you know, all that crystal stuff and <laughs> stuff leaking out of the battery. Mm-hmm. Do you ever remember thinking, this is not right? Oh, absolutely. I used to work in a battery lab. So we had, you know, the fun thing, well, the fun, not fun part of it is when you have to run away, you're not going to stop it, right? It, it's it's oxygen, it's, uh, fuel, and heat all in one. And so in certain tests, you know, we had what we'd call, you know, anecdotally a doom bucket, which is if that thing goes, just uh, let it push in the bucket, let it go in the parking lot and put itself out because there's nothing we could do. So, and when working on kind of that new bleeding edge chemistries of like how much energy can we get in this tiny space there's a lot of times we were like you know we, we don't want to push this too hard because you know time after time again uh, you'll see what happens yeah. <laughs> so uh nasa's done a phenomenal job with that they have all these fun videos of when they were working on batteries for the the suits that would power astronauts and um you know they, they really push everything to failure which uh if you've ever seen those videos they're incredible uh of, of how explosive batteries can really be and uh, I always like to ask uh, the people I'm interviewing about the future. What's your prediction on what the world of tech and batteries will look like in the 2030s? You know, by then we should have AR and VR glasses just being used as naturally as smartphones of today. Hopefully they'll be powered by LTO batteries and, you know, the metaverse will be everywhere. So what do you think about the uh, the next decade? Time. It'll all be a time problem is my prediction. Uh, we at Zappa have a quote of saying, the it's about time and saying that energy is really a time problem it's mostly not really an energy problem and i think that the second we get the idea of batteries that can charge in minutes um that's where the future is going to hold and i think it's just going to get faster and faster from there yeah. i think sitting around a charger for hours is going to feel archaic uh, very quickly and yeah. so i think in the future having any device you want to be able to power up in a few minutes uh, you know from zero to full is, is where it's going to go um, th- there's work to get there but uh, it's like you know, the idea of slow Wi-Fi now for anybody is almost painful. I think yeah. it's going to feel the same way with batteries. Yeah, I remember when uh, 
I went from a 300 board modem to 1200 and then 24 and then, you know, 14.4, 28.8, 56.6. All those were, were, Mm -hmm. you know, big jumps at the time, but yes, they're they're just uh, primitive and incredibly slow by today's, you know, gigabit LTE and 5G standards. (laughs) Right. Exactly. And we're glad batteries are finally getting there as well. It's taken a long time, but uh, Yes, may continue. So uh, my second last question is, what is the best piece of, piece of advice you've ever received to help you get where you are today? My, uh, my old mentor, who I, who I deeply respect, used to t- drill into my head uh, the, the quote over and over of, you'll never, ever get the right answer until you learn to ask the right question. Uh, and that never start with thinking you know until you learn to ask first. And I think that's what, you know, led me to learn that there's so much out there. And I think curiosity is, is kind of our, one of our greatest feats and just keep asking the right questions and eventually you'll, you'll figure out the way to get the right answer. Yeah. Well, it's like the, uh, the old saying garbage in garbage out. I mean, I've seen people try to ask questions of Google and that's what they give up. And it's like, you know, like try some different search terms, try asking in different ways the answer is there usually. <laughs> you just have to right. keep searching for it. So don't. You know, the other thing is, I guess, don't give up so so quickly with your uh, questions. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's how we all learn. You know. Yeah. Sometimes you need ninety nine poor questions to get to one good question, and then the one good question will set you on the right path. Yeah. Well, it's the the, the other saying is that it's a numbers game. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> So, Charlie, what is your final message to ITY viewers and readers and to your current and future customers and partners? So the, the one thing I'll have to say is, you know, um, but, or lithium titanate, we believe, is the way of the future. You know, lithium titanate is the safest, fastest, longest lasting battery that we know exists and will exist for a long time. And care where your batteries come from. You know, we all take reusable bags or grocery stores to try and reduce our impact. But, you know, care of the kind of batteries that are in your devices uh, for the future. And I think we'll all be much more happy after we have uh, these technologies on our devices. Well, Charlie, look, I've been yeah. waiting for this sort of announcement to come around for a long time. I, I mean, I'm a technology journalist. I'm in technology because I just love technology and the fact that you know, there's something new and exciting happening every day. And with batteries taking so long to truly you know, get to the next level, I mean, again, as I said, I've been waiting to hear something about this kind of a development for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, here it is. And, you know, th- you know, we should be seeing this within, almost, hopefully, almost all of our devices over the next few years, well before the decade is out. So it's really exciting to hear about this, to meet you, to learn about LTO. Uh, you know, we'll go from LTE on our 4G to 5G. Well, this is like going from LT, from, you know, lithium ion to LTO, <laughs> which is like <laughs> the 10G of batteries that. or something, you know. It's, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's a very exciting. So, I really thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Charlie Welsh, the CEO and co-founder of Zapbat. Thank you so much. And I hope we can talk again in the future. Appreciate it. I appreciate your questions. And, and thank you for having me. I enjoy getting to talk about it and, and enjoyed your angle and approach. And I love that LT to LTO thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. <laughs> well, I'm going to invite you to come and speak to uh, some user groups that I'm part of in Australia which are computer and technology groups. And uh, also there's a something called the Australian Seniors Computer Clubs Association, mainly for seniors. But I mean, I, you know, getting a presentation from you about this technology at our upcoming conference, which will be at the end of the year, would just be great because it's just showcasing the future to people. And, uh, you know, I think uh, people will be very excited to hear it. So thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.